Our next guest is Dr. Cleve Hicks, who has spent his life studying mankind's primate cousins. He spent six years in the Congo Basin studying western lowland gorillas and has trekked across savannas in search of eastern chimpanzees, but it's the plight of African rhinos that prompted him to write a new children's book called A Rhino to the Rescue, A Tale of Conservation and Adventure. Hicks also painted all of the illustrations in the book, which you can see a couple examples of on mangabay.com right now. Some of the proceeds from sales of the book will benefit the Black Mambas, South Africa's first all-female anti-poaching ranger unit. And the author himself is here to tell us all about it. Cleve Hicks, welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. So can you tell us a little bit about your background and what led you to write a children's book called A Rhino to the Rescue, A Tale of Conservation and Adventure? Yes, I'm a field primatologist. I've been working in uh, Africa for about the last 20 years on and off studying chimpanzees and gorillas. And I, you know, I was just very lucky to see some, some of the most remote and, uh, and most beautiful forests uh, surviving on the planet. And I fell in love with all of the, the wildlife and the complex ecosystems and the plants that I found in these forests. Um, and uh, met gorillas and chimpanzees and okapis and all these kind of incredible creatures. And unfortunately, though, at the same time I was learning about how all, the, all of these creatures kind of fit into the uh, matrix of the forest in which they live, the forests themselves were falling. Uh, we, we would run right into logging company operations and gold mining and diamond mining pits uh, dug into the forest. And unfortunately, that's opening these forests up to the bushmeat trade. And so it was a kind of a response to years of seeing this happen and trying to do something to, to put, put some brakes on this kind of crazy development that is, is ruining these beautiful places that made me want to write this book to kind of get the message out uh, to kids in particular that, that it's still not too late to do something. And, and, and as you've mentioned, you've done work on gorillas and especially chimps in the past. Um, so why, why did you make the main character of the children's book a rhino? What, was that a strategic decision? Ernest Horningway, yes. Well, he just kind of poured out of me in some way. I was uh, sort of doodling different kind of creatures. And, and when I was a kid, I used to be a, a fanatic of drawing dinosaurs. And, of course, rhinos aren't dinosaurs, um, but they, they're big and kind of imposing looking. And I, I really like the sort of whimsical combination of this top hat and cravat on, uh, and, and sort of creating this sort of civilized rhino named Ernest Horningway, who would then, you know, kind of do as just as I've done, go to Africa and meet his wild cousins and then, and then kind of do something, try and do something to save their, uh, their plight. But an, another reason I picked rhinos is because, I mean, chimpanzees are in, in terrible danger, and so are gorillas. Um, they're being wiped out. They're, they've dropped chimpanzee populations that probably dropped from a million 100 years ago to something like 200,000 today. But rhinos are doing even worse. Um, for instance, 75% of rhinos are, are found, uh, in Africa are found in South Africa. And uh, in the last nine years, 6,000 rhinos were poached in South Africa. And there's something like 21,000 rhinos left there. You can do the math and see these rhinos are going to be gone within a few years if something isn't done to stop this. And that's why there was a sort of an urgent call for me to, to say something about these rhinos. I mean, rhinos are so interesting. They're related to horses and tapirs, but of course they're, they're enormous and they have this smell-based uh, sensory system. And, and I just wanted to kind of learn more about rhinos and Ernest Horningway kind of allowed me to do that. Yeah, so speaking of doing something about rhino poaching, which of course, you know, poaching is one of the main threats to rhinos these days in Africa. Um, uh, your proceeds from your book are going to benefit the Black Mambas. Can you tell us a bit about, you know, tell us about their work and, and why that inspired you to uh, choose their, you know, the Black Mambas to support with the book? Yes, actually, uh, part of the proceeds of our book are going uh, to support this amazing uh, anti-poaching unit in South Africa. Uh, the Black Mambas are, are South Africa's first majority female anti-poaching unit. And basically, they are uh, people from the local communities who have been trained to uh, monitor wildlife populations there, report any kind of suspicious activities that you have of poachers trying to enter the park and kill rhinos and other wildlife. Um, in addition, they're educating the, the youngsters in the area about the value of keeping the wildlife alive as opposed to just liquidating it for short-term gains. Um, so I'm really proud to be working, uh, to be associated with this group. 
and, and we're going to try to get the message out about the work they're doing. They really need uh, funding uh, for uniforms and for supplies, and uh, we really hope that you'll go to their website. Um, you can look it up. It's the Black Mamba's Anti-Poaching Unit website, and check out their work. You can see videos about uh, the patrols they're doing, and really, they, these are incredibly brave young women, and, and I'm very happy to be promoting their group through this book. Okay, so you're going to read a, a selection from the book for us here today, but uh, do you want to just set it up for us first? So Ernest Honingway, he's this very dapperly dressed civilized rhinoceros who's gone uh, to Kenya to meet his wild cousins. And he thinks that the best way to do that is to put up a little deck chair, an umbrella, and wait for the wild rhinos to come and, and, and visit him and meet him. But the wild rhinos are not so sure of exactly what his intentions are. And one of them, uh, a young bull named Likambo, charges him and knocks him out of his seat. And then he finds himself, uh, well, I'll start here. Ernest was surrounded by hostile wild rhinoceroses. He feared the worst and indeed was terrified for his life. Fortunately, a wise and powerful rhinoceros elder, Wilhelmina, could tell by looking at him that Ernest was a kindly soul. Pushing the others aside, she calmly accepted his presence into the clan. Although she spoke no English, Wilhelmina communicated to Ernest through her sounds and actions. She let him know that no harm would come to him and that he was now a welcome visitor. That night, Wilh Wilhelmina led Ernest to a lonely waterhole. What had once been a place of happy rhinoceros reunions and romances was now nothing but a gloomy graveyard. Human hunters, hidden in the bushes, had shot several rhinos as they approached to drink the fresh water. They had then used machetes to cut the horns off the rhinos' heads to sell them to foreign markets. Ernest, struck with grief as he gazed upon the bleached white skeletons scattered around the pool, vowed to help Wilhelmina and the other rhinos. This was not a time for rainbow swirlers. This was serious and dangerous business. Over the next month, Ernest lived with his cousins and learned the ways of the wild rhino, how to find the choicest cuts of grass and to snort deeply and sniff the winds for signs of danger. Likambo even taught him how to charge thunderously. The hardest lesson for the haughty Ernest to learn was how to keep his head down while charging. When he did it right, he looked and felt as fearless as Likambo. Finally, the time came for Ernest to leave his newfound friends. The wild rhinos stood along the roadside and watched as he sped off on the back of Seba's Boda Boda, kicking up a trail of savanna dust. For the first time in, his, uh, in many years, they allowed themselves to feel some hope. Don't you all worry, Ernest yelled. I have a doozy of a plan. All right, great. Thanks for reading that for us. Oh, my pleasure. And so is that, so the, presumably the, the book goes on from there to detail his, his plan and, and how he goes about trying to save his, his cousins in Africa? Yes, exactly. And in fact, one of the big, uh, the key elements of the book that, that I have is sort of international co cooperation. You'll see sort of a, a painting with sort of, you know, the, how in Indiana Jones, they have the plane with a little red line going from one country to another. He's going to go to a whole other area of the, of the world uh, where the, where the uh, rhino products are actually being sold. And he's going to work together with the authorities of that, of that place to do something about it. And that's actually another one of the big messages of the book is that, yes, we are the problem. We humans are just, you know, very bad neighbors to the rest of the animals which is on the earth, and, and we're causing the problem, but we can also be the solution. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is if we work together. I mean, it's no good for Americans to point to Chinese and say, oh, look, they're, all, they're buying all these rhino horns, and the Japanese, well, I've seen the cove, and they're killing the dolphins. We need to look in the mirror as well and see what we're doing with factory farming, with the, the tropical timber we're buying, we're all part of the problem, but we need to all work together as part of the solution. And, and that's, you'll see in the book, that Ernest meets uh, different well-meaning people from all over the world who are going to try to stop the not-so-well-meaning people from basically just destroying nature for quick profit. Yeah, well, that's very interesting that, uh, you know, he goes and sees the problem firsthand, but then he, he uh, heads over to presumably Asia where... You know the demand for this rhino horn is is has led to this poaching crisis, and uh, it's it it's just really fascinating that you're able to highlight sort of the the international nature of these kinds of problems in a children's book. I think it's a really great message. Um, I'd love to I'd love it if we could you know just close out by um, you know can you talk a little bit about why you think this is a message that needs to be conveyed via a children's book and what in the end do you really hope that this kind of book can achieve unfortunately a lot of people around the world are are you know they're not necessarily 
cackling evilly as they plan to go and, and destroy nature and to kill rhinos for their horns and this and that. There's a lot of ignorance out there. And unfortunately, children are often brought up re- uh, believing things that are just flatly not true, um, such as uh, that you, know, you can pollute the planet and there's no consequences, or that you know, rhino horn cures, uh, cures some disease, uh, as is believed in, in, in some Asian countries. Um, there's all sorts of these kind of false beliefs out there. And I think we really need to reach the children with, with, a, with a different message um, so that children will, will, you know, and another thing is I really hope that children will read this and instead of being sort of overwhelmed with despair about what we're doing to the natural world, they'll see as an example in earnest, you know, he hears about what's happening in the, in, as he's reading the newspaper and, and he actually goes, he does everything he can to get to, the, to Africa and to meet the, the rhinos who are involved. And then that encourages him to go on from there and do something else. So it's, I, I really hope this book sort of counters the sort of you know, passivity that people feel or the sort of helplessness that people feel. You can go and you can meet uh, you know, th- this wildlife. You can go and you can meet people who are helping wildlife. And I, I really hope that that kind of gets across in the book, that you know, we shouldn't just uh, despair and seal ourselves off in our little bubbles, but we should go out there and, and try and make a difference in the world in the best way we can. Great. Well, thank you, Cleve, so much for coming on the show and for sharing that passage of the book with us and and just talking with us about it. Yeah, thank you for having me on. You can find more information about the Black Mambas at blackmambas.org. That's B-L-A-C-K-M-A-M-B-A-S dot org. And go to mangabay.com right now and you can find links to buy your very own copy of A Rhino to the Rescue, A Tale of Conservation and Adventure. Did you know that Manga Bay is a non-profit and as a nonprofit, we rely on the support of our readers. So if you value what you learn at the site and on this podcast, please visit mangabay.org slash donate to help make it all possible. There are numerous ways you can support Manga Bay. Read about them all and decide what works for you at mangabay.org slash donate. You can find all our podcast episodes on Android, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and TuneIn. And, of course, you can read all of our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com. If you want to keep up with us on Facebook, we're at facebook.com slash mangabay. And on Twitter and Instagram, our handle is at mangabay. Thanks, as always, for listening to the Mangabay Newscast. I'm your host, Mike Grecki, signing off. Talk to you again in two weeks.